Hello, it's Melanie, and we are just about ready to finish this book. This is chapter 11 of Race and the City, a compilation of essays that were edited by Henry Lewis Taylor, Jr. The book was published in 1993, and I was blessed to find it. So we're going to, uh, to finish this up, I believe, today. Chapter 11, Nina Jack Kig is the writer, contributor. Behind the scenes, the Cincinnati Urban League, 1948 to 1963. You can holler, protest, march, picket, demonstrate, but somebody must be able to sit in on the strategy, conferences, and pilot a course. There must be the strategist, the researchers, and the professionals to carry out a program. That's our role. That's a quote said Whitney M. Young, Jr. in 1964 as executive director of the National Urban League. During the 1950s and 1960s, American society underwent tremendous changes as African Americans waged an aggressive fight for their civil rights. Scholars of the civil rights movement have focused largely on the well-publicized activities of the Congress of Racial Equality, C-O-R-E, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, NAACP, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, SCLC, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, SNCC, and the charismatic role of Martin Luther King Jr. Sit-ins, protests, marches, freedom rides, picket lines, and boycotts in the South have attracted the attention of, mo of most scholars, while only little consideration has been given to civil rights activities in the North. Has this, has this single-minded focus on the civil rights battles of the South caused us to miss a vital struggle taking place in the North? This chapter examines the efforts of the Urban League to improve race relations in Cincinnati during the turbulent years of the civil rights movement. While the struggle in the South received much media coverage, the Cincinnati Urban League utilized a behind-the-scenes or non-confrontational approach as a strategy for social change. Considering confrontation dysfunctional, the Urban League resorted to quiet negotiations at the office level rather than activism oriented toward maximizing the visibility of racial inequality. This chapter examines the use and effectiveness of the League's technique in the fields of employment, education, and recreation from 1948 to 1963. The Cincinnati Urban League, CUL, was founded on September 24, 1948. A major concern of the League during its initial years was the development of job opportunities for Cincinnati's steadily increasing black population. In 1948, one half of Cincinnati's companies with more than 1,500 employees did not hire African Americans, in part because unions excluded them from their ranks while some companies employed African Americans exclusively in menial positions. In the early 1950s, for example, the local telephone company employed almost 3,000 Cincinnatians, of whom no more than 50 were black, all of them, confined exclusively to labor categories. Immediately after its inception, the League began to serve as mediator between black workers and the Queen City's business community. As early as December 1948, the Cincinnati Urban League developed a program of industrial relations headed by Francis L. Dowdell, a graduate of the Atlanta University School of Social Science and Wilberforce University. 
The Industrial Relations Program under Dow Dell became the focus of CUL activities during its early years. Dow Dell consulted with business and industry, labor organizations, and public and private agencies, and urged them to hire African Americans and upgrade opportunities based on merit. Moreover, the industrial secretary recruited qualified African Americans and prepared them for placement, quote unquote, in newly created work situations, with a footnote. In the five-year period between 1948 and 1953, the Cincinnati Urban League made 523 so-called pilot placements. Each participant was hand-picked, quote unquote, to assure that desegregation would occur gradually and in a non-disruptive manner. Illustrative of the League's technique were its first attempts at desegregating the workforce of Cincinnati's department stores. In early September 1948, the League approached the Shillito department store about the employment of African Americans as sales personnel. The League encountered opposition, however, and Executive Secretary Joseph A. Hall concluded that the time was not quite ripe for such a move. That's a quote with a footnote. Nevertheless, Hall and Dowdell decided to start work on the problem by establishing close relations with the people in power. In the case of the Shillito department store, they were able to get support from its vice president, Fred Lazarus III. Lazarus. Shillito Lazarus. Got it whom they placed on the board of the League. The move was successful, for soon thereafter, Shilito officials began discussing with the League the upgrading of qualified African Americans already employed by the store. As a result, Shilito hired its first black salesperson. Dow Dell concluded, and this is a quote, the whole job was executed through the establishing of such close relationships with Fred Lazarus himself, end quote footnote. Soon, other stores followed Shillito's example. In early 1949, Dow Dell reported that Ben's department store, with a total of 32 employees, had 11 African Americans who worked in service, general, clerical, and sales capacities. While Max Clothing Store employed nine African Americans out of a total of 19 employees, in 1950, Dow Dell reported that some progress has been made. Three of the largest downtown department stores already have employed Negro girls as fur storage, stock, and information clerks. Throughout the 1950s, the League continued to program its program of industrial relations, but also utilized its negotiation technique to desegregate and to prevent the further segregation of Cincinnati's educational and recreational facilities. In the fall of 1952, Betty Donovan, a Cincinnati Post reporter, sought the help of the League in the case of the three black children in the Graham family. The principal of Springmeyer School had for over three years refused to admit the grandchildren and had referred them to schools in other districts. These schools also denied admission, though, because the Grams lived in the Springmeyer district. Subsequently, the children failed to attend school for one year. Then the Addiston School agreed to accept them but did not provide school bus transportation. After Donovan's phone call, Executive Secretary Hall visited the Grams and confirmed Donovan's story. He then went to see Springmeyer's principal, who assured Hall that the problem was not racially motivated, but one of transportation, as school bus facilities could not be arranged for them, the Graham children. That's a quote with a footnote. Nothing came from this meeting, and on October the 9th, 1952, Hall called Springmeyer's principal to point out the urgency of the Graham problem in view of possible unfavorable news coverage. Hall's use of this subtle pressure yielded a partial success. 
On October 28, the president of the Board of Education of Green Township informed Hall that all children involved in the controversy would be picked up by the Addison School Bus beginning November the 1st. In the Graham case, Hall utilized the behind-the-scenes technique developed by the Industrial Relations Department to address educational problems of Cincinnati's black population. Instead of arousing masses, Hall appealed initially to the moral conscience of officials in key positions. If this approach failed to secure cooperation, Hall resorted to the use of subtle pressure by pointing to the possible negative effects of publicity. It was obvious, however, that the League was not prepared to intervene further and compromise its, beha its behind-the-scenes role. Meanwhile, the League began to play an active role in the desegregation of Coney Island, Cincinnati's mayor amusement, major amusement park. In January 1952, members of the NAACP and the Cincinnati Committee on Human Rights, CCHR, an affiliate of CORE, began picketing the amusement park in protest of its exclusion of African Americans. In March, the CCHR decided to desegregate Coney Island during the upcoming season. Initially, the organization hoped to secure a conference with the park manager. When this failed, members of the CCHR continued picketing outside Coney Island's downtown office on 6th and Main, while others tried to enter the park. At the end of July, Cincinnati City Council formed a committee to look into the racial policy of Coney. In the fall, the committee asked the League to help in assembling information about the situation in amusement parks in other areas in the United States. Hall wrote a letter to all Urban League affiliates asking for data concerning the racial policies of private amusement parks in preparation for a possible contact with Coney Island officials. In 1953, the CCHR continued its activities against Coney Island, and as a result, the State Conservation Department canceled a wildlife exhibit at the amusement park. In addition, the issue was brought to the courts by the NAACP. On July 2nd and 4th, Ethel Fletcher, a black member of the NAACP, tried to enter Coney Island, but park officials denied her admission. At the same time, Edward L. Schott, the president of Coney Island became increasingly concerned with a possible economic loss due to these activities and contacted Dorothy Dolby of the Mayor's Friendly Relations Committee, MFRC. Dolby referred him to Joseph A. Hall, and on November 19, Schott took the initiative and discussed the matter with Hall. Schott initially expressed fears that desegregating the park would lead to financial losses and spark a violent public reaction, particularly on the parts of the few white hoodlums whom he knows frequent the park. That is a quote with a footnote. Despite these concerns, Schott called Hall in December requesting information about other amusement parks. After looking through the material Hall had gathered during the previous year, Schott met with Hall on January 21st, 1954. Schott did not oppose opening the park to African Americans except for the use of Moonlight Gardens, the park's ballroom. Hall suggested that there should not be a public announcement of the desegregation of the park and contended, quote, that quite quiet handling would be a better procedure, end quote, footnote. At the end of the meeting, to sh secure Schott's continued confidence and cooperation, Hall assured him that their contacts were strictly off the record. Despite the apparent ease with which Schott agreed to desegregate the park, problems occurred soon afterward. At the opening of the 1954 season of Coney Island, members of the CCHR attempted to enter the park but were denied admission. By that time, too, the court case initiated by the NAACP had aroused increased publicity. 
Throughout the court controversy, negotiations between the, the uh, CUL and Coney Island came to a standstill. While the League and Coney Island officials remained friendly, quote unquote, they did not discuss the issues. In July 1954, Ethel Fletcher was awarded an injunction against the park, allowing her to enter Coney Island. The ruling applied only to her, though, and not to African Americans in general. In protest, Cincinnati ministers from various churches, churches drew up a petition asking the park to stop its Jim Crow policy. This attracted widespread publicity and was followed by another attempt by NAACP members to enter the park. In August 1954, an interracial group consisting of 50 adults and children was denied admission. Public pressure grew when 65 clergymen issued a statement of concern urging a change in the admission policy of the park. The park's management aroused by the publicity, the court case, and the resulting activities had caused Fear, econo feared economic loss and eventually expressed a willingness to engage in negotiations to secure a peaceful desegregation, desegregated opening for 1955. As time moves on and our children get older and don't get to enjoy Coney Island, ah, there you go, wheels of justice grind slowly. They agreed with Hall that publicity, further demonstrations, and fanfare were unwise in contrast to a quiet, unpublicized, well-planned job. Schott proposed a step-by-step -step procedure desegregating all facilities except the pool. Now the pool's in there. The pool and moonlight gardens in 1955. Explaining the proposal, Schott Kylie and Walks explained or claimed that, this is a quote, any withdrawal on the part of regular clientele would throw the park into financial reverse, end quote. Because the pool and dance hall represented the quote unquote heart operations of the park, Hall reluctantly gave in. I can see your point, he said and am inclined to go along with you. Yet, I must point out that a sound procedure would be a complete open policy once and for all. Hall then suggested that Coney Island officials prepare the 1955 opening in cooperation with local civil rights groups. The park managers balked, characterizing members of some of the groups as troublemakers. Instead, they demanded a, to discuss the question among themselves and then call a meeting with the Urban League, the NAACP, and park representatives. The meeting never took place, however, because the park manager opposed the NAACP's insistence on involvement of groups other than the Urban League. The NAACP, in the meantime, had combined forces with the Jewish Community Relations Committee Committee, or JCRC, and the Civil, Civil Liberties Union in order to convince the city manager, C.A. Harrell, to withhold Coney's operating license. Good move. Schott rejected the intervention of these civil rights groups. Quote, we do not, oppose, we do not propose to have Mr. Barry NAACP or Mr. Posner, JCRC, tell us how to run Coley Island, end quote, footnote. Five days later, the city's safety director, Oris E. Hamilton, approved Coney's license. All right. In April 1955, Following the confrontation with the NAACP, the JCRC, and the Civil Liberties Union, Schott asked Hall for support of a quiet opening of Coney Island. Haven't I heard that before? How many times have they had this quiet opening? 
happening. Five days later, the city safety director, oh, I'm sorry, I started where he approved the Coney's license. Mm-hmm. Okay. I'll just read this again. In April 1955, following the confrontation with the NAACP, the JCRC, and the Civil, Ro Civil Liberties Union, Schott asked Hall for support of a quiet opening of Coney Island. Except for the general admission of African Americans, the park's racial policy remained vague. As the management decided, quote, not to do any specific planning relative to the swimming pool and dance pavilion until such a time a problem presents itself. Yeah, let's wait until a riot. Let's wait for a riot. Hall conferred with Webster Posey, president of the local NAACP, and both agreed that the NAACP, quote, will set up control so that those who attend the park will be handpicked for a period, end quote, footnote. Moreover, the League and the NAACP agreed to organize efforts so that, quote, non-whites should arrive singly or in pairs, end quote, footnote. After the park opening on April the 30th, 1955, bi-weekly cont contacts between Hall and park officials continued. While African Americans in numbers from six to 25 attended the amusement park. No hostile incidents were reported. Only once did the park manager have to remove signs posted some distance from the park that read, quote, niggers don't go to Coney, end quote. Footnote. <laughs> Throughout the first month after the opening, Hall inquired, periodically about the pool policy, but shot in the park manager, Ralph G. Wax, remained non-committal. Finally, on July 4th, 1955, George Johnson, a black park visitor, challenged Coney's pool policy by taking a swim. The pool manager and Wax discussed the matter. Oh boy, I bet there was a fleeing from the pool. Can you imagine this black man dives into the pool? Everybody's out. Everybody's out. Ah, with Johnson and persuaded him to withdraw from the pool. Johnson left the park without any further disturbance and the incident received no publicity in the local press. In addition to the continued segregation of the pool and dance hall, the admission of interracial groups remained a problem. Some Cincinnati companies, such as Gren Watch, Fashion Frock, and General Electric, asked Hall about the possibility of having mixed personnel picnics at Coney. But Schott believed it in it in expedient, oh, but Schott believed it in expedient and advised Hall to wait until later that year or until 1956. Hall's confidential behind the scenes negotiations prepared the way for an agreement prior to the opening of the park in 1955. To prevent economic loss through racial violence, Coney Island's management agreed to admit African Americans, and the League and the NAACP promised careful timing and selection of visitors. But the 1955 policy was only a partial victory for the League. As long as the pool and the dance hall remained segregated, Coney Island was still unfinished business and sure to arouse public opinion in the future. Four years later, in 1959, the pool and dance hall problem surfaced again. This time, however, the League was less successful in negotiating with Coney, Island, Coney officials. In July, Margaret Riley informed Hall that her son and a group of friends had been denied admission to a rock and roll concert at Moonlight Gardens. 
switchboard operators at the park and at Coney's down downtown office had told her that African Americans would not be welcomed at Moonlight Gardens. Hall then called upon Schott, stressing the legal implications of park representatives denying anyone the right to use a facility that is publicly advertised. Schott claimed to be unaware of the specific problem, but pointed out that rock and roll concerts had indeed caused some disorder in the past. Moreover, Schott admitted that he did not like African Americans attending such concerts because of the trouble potential of the teenage gathering. Believing that the time was not right for desegregating Moonlight Gardens, Schott nevertheless agreed to think about the matter and to discuss the problem with other park officials. Three days later, Schott informed Hall that the management had decided not to consider an open policy. At the dance hall, Schott, until then very cooperative, excitedly complained that Coney Island, quote, was being focused on while other parks did not even allow non-whites on their grounds, end quote, footnote. Hall, eager to maintain cooperation with Schott, responded that he had inquired just to point to possible, possibly sound planning. Schott had grown impatient, however, and ended the conversation abruptly. This thing's been going on for what? Three years now and he's impatient? He's impatient? Hall informed Riley about the conversation and advised her about legal actions she should take but he left the decision to her. After four months of no contact, Hall took the initiative and wrote Schott a letter, assuring him that his whole interest in Coney Island over a period of time has been progress for a race relations point of, from a race relations point of view rather than conflict. Despite earlier successes with the management of Coney Island, the incident of 1959 illustrated the major shortcomings, shortcoming of the League's approach. The success of its cautious behind-the-scenes technique depended largely on the cooperation of the white establishment. If mediation failed, the League, unwilling to sacrifice its good relationship with many key people in the community, was not prepared to intervene further. Two years later, the amusement park once more began the focus of civil rights, became the focus of civil rights attention. This time, however, the league was not only mediator between the black community and white park officials, but also between the various civil rights groups involved in the struggle for Coney's desegregation. On April 29, 1961, a black couple sent by the Congress of Racial Equality was refu refused admission to Moonlight Gardens, shot, quote unquote, excited and disturbed. Called Hall, indicating his refusal to talk with core and NAACP officials, end quote, footnote. Hall believed this to be a decided mistake and urged Schott to tell, to talk to the groups in question. This Schott, the last name is S-C-H-O-O-T. As in March, I wonder. We'll have to look that up. I'll let you know. But as the conversation later revealed, the roadblock was not Schott who had been ill for several months, but WACHS, W-A-C-H-S, I'll have to look that up, who, in the meantime, handled the park. WACHS, quote, fearful of economic loss, troublemakers, and the future of the park, end quote, had refused to see core members. This, Hall observed, had led to, quote, mutual dislike, 
which was only made both, which has only made both core and NAACP more determined. Throughout the following two months, Hall maintained close contact with Walks. Although he cooperated, Hall noticed that Walks, who in the past had displayed little or no willingness to accept an open policy, showed, quote, unquote, no conviction as to the rightness of desegregated facilities. Shortly after the dance hall incident in April 20, of April 29, Eugene Martin, the co-chair of CORE, informed Hall that his organization had devised a plan to make use of the pool and dance hall during the 1961 season and asked the league for cooperation. Throughout May, CORE and the NAACP picketed the park, leading to the arrest of 27 black and white women and men for trespassing and disorderly conduct. On May 20th and 25th, members of both groups attempted to use Coney's pool. According to William F. Bowen, president of the NAACP, 16 members went to Coney and six of the group were arrested on trespass warrants filed by the park police. The park manager, Walks, claimed that no violence was involved and said that the groups were, reje were ejected because they had, quote, unquote, blocked the turnstiles at the pool. At this point, Coney officials acceded to the demonstrations and agreed to a conference with representatives of local civil rights groups. The subsequent me meeting on May 27, 1961, resulted in a decision for joint action to desegregate all facilities starting May 30th, explaining the decision, Schott declared. For 75 years, Coney Island has made available to the people of this area the finest amusement park in the world. We intend to continue that service. With reference to recent events, which have received some publicity, I wish to say that any person whose motives are only to use the facilities we provide and who is prepared to conduct himself properly will be admitted to any part, any part of the park. The desegregation of Coney Island was publicized as a significant victory for the NAACP and Corps, but the League although not present during the crucial May meeting, played an important role in the desegregation of Coney Island. Since 1952, Hall had carefully timed his negotiations with park officials, gaining their confidence and cooperation. Hall utilized this mutual trust to ask for, but never to demand, desegregation. Moreover, he never threatened park officials with publicity and was willing to accept partial victories rather than to make no progress at all. As a result, Coney officials admitted African Americans to the amusement park, although they continued to exclude them from the pool and dance hall. Nevertheless, as the 1959 incident showed, the league's success depended on the cooperation of the white establishment and pressure from activist groups as well. Coney Island's management sought to help, sought the help of the league only after civil rights groups had been picketing the park. Fear of negative publicity and possible economic losses compelled park officials to open negotiations with the Urban League. The final struggle over Coney's desegregation also illustrates that new forces gained momentum in the late 1950s and early 1960s. Less patient than the uh, CUL, these civil rights activists rejected the League's gradualism and its behind-the-scenes approach and increasingly resorted to boycotts, sit-ins, protest marches and picket lines in order to accelerate desegregation. Because at this point, 
Johnny's been waiting almost 10 years to get in the pool. If Johnny was 10, when they started, he was almost 20 when they finally got access. Not only Coney Island, but Cincinnati's business community at large became the target of these groups. In April 1960, several African Americans began picketing Cincinnati's Woolworth store to expose the chain's Jim Crow policy in the South. In fall 1962, civil rights activists gathered outside the Hamilton County Courthouse and sang hymns protesting against discriminatory treatment of African Americans in the South. It was not until 1963, however, that Cincinnati awoke to a cold, hard reality. In June 1963, several demonstrations involving violence occurred at school construction sites exposing discriminatory practices in the building trades. I'm sorry, but I'm thinking about the building trades and I'm thinking that it has only been, it is now May 2019. And I would say no fewer than five years ago. I hardly saw one black person working on construction sites. Now, today you drive past and there may be two or three And we're talking 1961. Okay, I'll continue reading. Okay. In June 1963, several demonstrations involving violence occurred at school's construction sites exposing discriminatory practices in the building trades. Between July 2nd and 4th, 1963, I'm sorry, that was 1963, Police Chief Stanley Schrotel reported that African Americans had assembled in crowds, used vulgar language, and interfered with officers making arrests. Marshal Bragdon, director of the MFRC, characterized the situation as one of growing pains while Schrotel called it potentially explosive. Many Cincinnatians may have agreed with the Cincinnati Enquirer, which was startled by what seemed the sudden awakening of racial unrest. In the fall of 1963, it asked, quote, what's wrong? Why are the Negroes protesting? Isn't all that discrimination and segregation the South's worry? What are all these meetings and pronouncements about? Why the demonstrations, the picketing, the boycotting here in fair-minded Cincinnati? That's a quote with a footnote. City officials and the CUL, however, were not taken by surprise and had prepared a course of action Beginning in June 1963, several conferences were being had, were held involving the city manager, the city solicitor, the director of safety, the chief of police, the fire chief, the executive director of the MFRC, and the league. The goal of these meetings was to establish guidelines for the police in handling nonviolent direct action demonstrations. The Cincinnati Urban League, the only organization representing African Americans, took an active role in shaping the police guidelines in the interest of black protesters. Chief Schrotel proposed that the primary responsibility of the police division is to protect life and property. Joseph A. Hall was successful in adding the word liberty 
to the phrase. Moreover, Hall added to Schrotel's outline a sentence stating that, quote, the demonstrators and the opposition must be protected in the public's interest. End quote. Footnote. Thus, despite the Cincinnati Urban League's rejection of nonviolent direct action, the League indirectly aided civil rights activists through its negotiations with city officials. Hall explained his action by pointing out that the Cincinnati Urban League did not reject methods other than negotiations. This is a quote. Our behind-the-scenes work is just one way to handle the problem. We know the other groups and other techniques also are needed. We don't claim any prior rights in the work on behalf of equal opportunity for all. End quote. Footnote. In fact, as the Coney Island case showed, the League profited from the pressure exerted by civil rights groups. Businessmen trying to avoid becoming targets for militant desegregationists turned to the uh, Cincinnati Urban League for help in desegregating their businesses gradually. They sought the help of the League because it offered confidentiality, thereby avoiding publicity that might be, might have incited the population. Moreover, while other groups that fostered desegregation underwent continuous change in leadership, Hall represented a consistent negotiation partner. In this light, the follow-up service the League provided was of special importance. The League not only opened new job opportunities for skilled African Americans, it also helped to overcome adjustment problems blacks and whites faced in their new employment situation. The effectiveness of the League's behind-the-scenes technique is difficult to assess. The League was able to secure the confidence and support of many influential white citizens who favored the organization's gradual approach over radical changes and who were willing to make at least partial concessions. Moreover, the League was able to maintain cooperation with white citizens even in times when communication between key officials and civil rights groups had broken down. Thus, the League became an important link between civil rights activists and the white establishment. Nevertheless, the League's quiet diplomacy was effective only when the white decision makers were willing to cooperate. Moreover, as the struggle for the desegregation of Coney Island showed, quiet negotiations were most successful when combined with either direct action or at least the threat of such. Without the use of economic and political pressure, the League's behind-the-scenes strategies lacked an important force. The League was afraid to exert pressure lest it lose its standing, but unless it pushed, it had little leverage. The limitations of the League's approach became obvious during the late 1950s and early 60s. African Americans no longer asked for concessions but publicly demanded social justice and democracy. Moreover, the passage of the Civil Rights Act in 1964 and the establishment of the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission made the League's gradualistic behind-the-scenes role seem outmoded. So that is the end of the book, folks. We made it. We made it through like an old friend. We're just going to put it down. But of course, I've got to take this to the library because I don't own it. I need to go and buy one. You can get it on Amazon. I strongly suggest that you go and purchase that book. It's so old. It may be in half price books. As a matter of fact, it may have been a, a collection for a student classroom, they may have several of them and, and then with no action on them and because it's so old, they probably put them, gave them away or maybe they're at Goodwill or, or gave them to half price books and you can get several of them. Hey, you just never know. 
Believe it, think it, go get it. All right. So um, I just want to share with you the next book that I'm going to read. There it is. How the North promoted, prolonged, and profited from slavery, complicity, complicity. So I'm excited. And just like Race in the City, I just came across this. I just came across it. I believe that the Lord is just bringing stuff to me. So anyway, I'm excited to read this. Uh, I found it uh, somewhere and ordered it from the library, of course, and they sent it to me. They sent it to my neighborhood branch, and I was able to go and pick it up. So it is How the North Promoted, Prolonged, and Profited from Slavery, Complicity. It is written by Ann Farrow, Joelle Lang, and Jennifer Frank. So... I'll be doing the same. I'm going to read the preface if there's a preface. I'm going to read the introduction if there's an introduction. The only thing I'm not reading is the acknowledgments. That's kind of private and personal, so we'll just leave that in the book. And if you want to be nosy, you can get the book and read it for yourself. Um, I'm, I'm not even sure about I see a lot of pictures, a lot of images. Um, I'm not seeing much when it comes to footnotes. Uh, let's see if there is an index. Ah, great. There's a great index. So if you're looking for something specific by subject, oh, there's Black Laws on page 159, 160, and 161. Oh, it's looking good, good, good. And, um, oh, nice. There's a chronology in here telling you when things happen, major things happened with relation to... Uh, to uh, the complicity of the North with regard to slavery, I'm, I'm assuming. Okay, I'm excited. I'm excited to share this with you. Another one that I want to share is called Going Home. This was written, and I've referred to it, and I've used some of the material from this, uh, Going Home. It was written, um, what? Look at this, by Charles F. Casey Langenger and students of the Public History Practicum, Department of History at the University of Cincinnati. That's why some of the stuff in here looked so familiar from Race in the City. He was one of the contributors in Race in the City. That's why I saw those similarities. So this is going home, the struggle for fair housing in Cincinnati. So it's a specific area of concentration. And this is from a specific time period, 1900 to 20 to uh, 2007. Ah, isn't that awesome? So I'm excited about this. So a lot of what I read in Race in the City, you're probably going to hear it here because he contributed to Race in the City. Um, so that's great. And now I have to make a decision. Am I going to read Going Home first? It is shorter. It is shorter. I may read Going Home first. And I did drop that in the links, the whole thing, all of Going Home. I think there are how many pages? 19. Going Home is not long at all. 20, 24, 23, 24 pages Going Home. And so the whole thing, the PDF, is in one of the chapters in the table of contents. And if it's not, just put in a comment or something that you didn't get it, and I'll get it. But I'm sure when I get ready to read it, I'll drop it. I'll drop it then. So I've enjoyed this. I really have. And I've never read a book out loud, recorded myself doing it, uh, cold turkey, or even knowing the book. And I'm going to do the same thing with complicity. I'm not going to read it before I read it to you. We're going to read it together. So you're just going to have to hold tight and bear with me when I stumble, okay? Or I don't read something with, with pure understanding, okay? All right. So um, I'm going to let you go. God bless. Bye-bye.